and we'll go ahead and move into our final question and answer session. We've got quite a few questions coming in and we'll get to as many as we can. So our first question is for David. Um, as part of my degree work, I did undergraduate research and wrote a senior thesis. When asked for a writing sample, would it be appropriate to send a digital version of my thesis and or papers I wrote for classes? Yes, completely appropriate. Anything you've written, especially if you've got a good grade on it, especially if um, anything was published out of it, if you published an abstract as part of your research, yes, any of those things would be completely appropriate. Great, thank you. And then Steve, we have one here. Um, after listening to David's presentation, can you comment on what your department is doing well and what changes could be made within specific courses in regards to providing more opportunities for technical and non-technical writing? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, I found David's presentation fascinating and a little bit bracing. Um, you know, we're all seeing this decline in skills and it really, you know, being in a university, I think it's uh, it's incumbent on us to try to be um, part of the solution. So I, I think in, in uh, you know, David's presentation as well as my, my preparation for this has got me thinking a lot about what we could be doing better. What I mean, it first of all got me more familiar with um, what we already are doing in our curriculum, but also thinking about what we should do better. We've just, as I mentioned briefly, we've just undergone a, a major curriculum review, and that's beginning a shift from a more content-based curriculum to a more skills-based curriculum. And so, you know, I showed some examples at the undergraduate level I'm referring to here, you know, of, of how we already are, are working writing through the curriculum. I think we need to be doing that a lot more. And I think, um, you know, one of the insights I've had from preparing for this is to, to switch more to short, lots of short exercises with feedback rather than, I think, a default mode for a lot of us in academia is, the, is a term paper. And, and I think that's probably taking um, two leaps too many to get to that point. So that's one thing at the graduate level. Um, you know, we're, we're also going to be changing our graduate curriculum um, here at Virginia Tech. Um, the graduate school is going to be requiring us to have a, um, a common set of courses for all grad students. That's a, an interesting proposition in a geoscience department where we don't typically think of geochemists and geophysicists at the master's or PhD level as needing a lot of the same courses. But one thing where, where I think we really should be building a course is something in scientific communication as well as ethics. And um, I, I used to teach a course like that at the University of Wyoming. And so I think we'll be uh, we'll be building something like that here. Great, thank you. Um, got a few more questions here. Can you discuss the importance of citations? It seems now that people are only citing sources from the past 10 years or less and disregard things prior to that. So is there some guidance um, for both agency and academic work about how old your citations you can go back for quoting? I, I'll just say in state government, um, there is no guidance, but I, especially in geology, uh, a lot of the fundamental principles and fundamental concepts of regional geology were established more than 10 years ago. And it's, it's completely, completely appropriate to, um, to cite older things. And I think it's, it's necessary to, to cite older works. That's my answer. And Steve, do you have any comments on that? Um, yeah, I guess I I think, I mean, I agree with what David said. It's definitely appropriate to, to cite older work. I think that uh, when you look at the lifetime, you know, scientific articles have a shelf life. And um, and there are million, literally millions of them now. And so, um, you know, it's a big topic, the whole issue of citations and, and how that, you know, how... how Bibliometrics is playing into to science, and um, it's a big topic in academia. I, but it is a fact of life that, I mean, if you just look at the citation, I could look at the citations of any one of my papers, and they, you know, they get cited for for a while, and then you know it sort of rises, and then it falls off. Um, I do think you know for really seminal, some papers keep getting cited for decades and decades, and that's because they're really seminal. Um, but when you're citing literature, uh, you know, you're always making choices. You can't. You can't cite 500 papers in 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 your in your own papers. So you're always making choices, and I think um, there are no rules, no hard and fast rules. I think you want if you're saying something that some you know your someone had at a discovery that you should really be recognizing the original work, then there's you should be going back to G.K. Gilbert if that's the seminal reference. You know, there's there's no limit. 
Great, thanks for that. Um, we have a few more here. What differences are there in scientific writing for peer-reviewed journal publications versus technical reports for agencies, especially for us graduate students looking at entering state agency careers? Yeah, I'll take this one. Uh, I, there's definitely a lower bar for state agencies. Uh, for a technical report for a state agency, you're not likely to, uh, I'd say the general rule is you're not going to have uh, much in the way of external review. You'll have a, a, a robust robust internal edit and a robust, robust internal peer review. Um, I, now, having said that, for at least some of the things we do, we, we, we send them out for external review. But I would say, generally speaking, state agency reports have a, a lower standard for, for peer review than a, than a journal article. And that's why uh, they are sometimes referred to as the gray literature. It, it just has undergone uh, a lesser standard of, of peer review. Yeah, and I would, I would just say, um, I mean, if you're a grad student who, who really is aiming for a career in state government, I don't think that really necessarily should prevent you or even dissuade you from trying to publish something um, in the peer-reviewed literature. I, th I think that's the gold standard. I think it's a great experience uh, going through peer review. Um, it, is, uh, it is a higher bar, as David said, uh, but it's not necessarily a bar you'll never see again, and you might not necessarily be able to predict where your career will go. And I would venture to guess that um, if, you, if you did get something through peer review and published um, in the peer review literature, that that's a feather in your cap, even if you are trying to get hired by a state agency. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Steve. And I have found myself, you know, writing something uh, with with the knowledge that it would be undergoing external peer review, and it definitely um, raises the heat somewhat in, in terms of the quality of the the writing. Great. Okay, we've got time for a few more questions. Um, this one is about uh, graphical representation of information. So can you talk a little bit about the skills needed to um, graphically represent information such as in infographics? You know, there's, there's maps, there's figures and charts and papers, but what about the more non-technical science communication of infographic development? Uh, do you have any tips for where students can learn those skill sets? I, you know, I think there, I'm, I wish I could find, I found some great websites um, of people, there are graphic designers who think about these things and have, you know, Twitter feeds or blogs, uh, websites, services, software. I think it's a, I think it's a great question, um, not just for infographics, um, for you know, public kinds of um, consumption, but all, but even within scientific publications, um, sometimes it's the figures that really will hold up publication of something because a, a poor figure, um, you know, present, presenting your data in a way that's um, that's appealing, that's clear, that's simple. Uh, I, there's an art to it, um, and a whole lot of skills, but also some art to it. And so I wish I could, off the top of my head, um, refer you to some, um, you know, resources for that. But if you poke around, if you Google around, you know, graphic designers, science illustration, something like that, uh, there are a lot of people out there who, th who, uh, who tweet about this, who think very deeply about it and are really happy to engage with scientists. Great, thanks for that. Well, that's about all we have time for today. And if you have any questions that were not addressed today, you can always email them to us at goalie at americangeosciences.org, and we'll make sure to send your questions along to Steve and David. Thank you again, Steve and David, for sharing your time, expertise, and insight with us today. We really appreciate it. And uh, this concludes our webinar for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time.